Sophie Atwood, co-author of the playbook for guiding diners toward plant-rich dishes in food service, will fascinate us with the help of Jane Uprichard, who is specialized in nutrition and behavioral sciences at Google, by explaining how we can implement more plants in our menu. Welcome, welcome, welcome again. I'm glad you're joining us on the stream worldwide uh, for Eating the Gap. First subject is a really important one because it's the basis of all subjects. It's um, about the effective strategies you can have for adopting plant-based food. And we're going to talk about uh, that uh, to Sophie and uh, Jane. Uh, Sophie's up first. Hi, Sophie. How are you? Thank you. Can you hear me? I hear you perfectly, Sophie. Um, <laughs> that's that's one brilliant, <laughs> brilliant how the internet works. Um, so can you tell us, um, what are those effective strategies for uh, adopting plant-based food? Well, we're about to present on that. So we've got our slide deck here. Yeah. <laughs> we, have a big, we have a big list. So thank you. Very happy to be here and presenting today alongside Dr. Jane Uprichard who is Global Director of Nutrition and Wellbeing at Compass, working on the Google account. And what we want to talk about is some of our applied research using insights and methods from behavioural science to help consumers choose more plant-rich dishes. So if we can move on to the next slide. Sure we can. And if you're interested in why this is a question that we're working on, this slide helps illustrate what it shows is the relative impact of different types of foods on the environment. And it clearly shows here that meat and ruminant meat in particular, beef and lamb, has a far higher environmental footprint than common plant-based foods like beans, legumes and pulses. And actually, when you look per gram of protein, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions it takes to produce, beef is around 20 times higher than beans, making it a really inefficient food source. Uh, next slide, please. And a bit more context on this chart. Um, this graph looks a bit confusing, but what it's actually showing is the relative importance of getting people to change their diets compared to other things we could do in the food system to make an impact. So if you look at this big yellow bar on the left-hand side, what that shows us is the predicted greenhouse gas emissions from food by the year 2050 if we keep on doing what we're doing. And on the right-hand yellow bar, <laughs> not done yet, sorry, is the is where we need to be, target greenhouse gas emissions. And all these different steps in the process here are all the different things that we could do to try to get the food system to be more sustainable. What I really want to point your attention towards is the long red bar in the top left corner. That's actually the bar that represents the impact of shifting yep. people towards more plant-based diets. So while it's one step in the process, it's actually having the largest impact in reducing greenhouse gas emissions compared to all the different things we can do from focusing on more sustainable agriculture across the board. So next slide, please. We're quite clear on the problem now. Um, our diets have a big impact on the climate. And that message is one that's increasingly communicated to consumers in the media and by think tanks like the one I work for. Yet when we ask consumers the reasons why they choose the food they do, they still tend to write uh, to rank climate as quite low down in their list of priorities, it tends to be far lower down than other more immediate factors like price and taste. So. Next slide. As a behavioural scientist um, working for an NGO, my job's to answer a, questions, a question like why isn't the climate impact of food something that people are thinking about? And one uh, helpful model that we use to think about this question is actually outlined on this slide here, and we call it the dual process model of decision making. In very brief, this model states that we have two systems in the brain that we use to make decisions, including decisions about what we eat. The system one on the left hand side is our default system and it operates quickly and automatically um, and it helps us make decisions really quickly in our day to day environment. And so we don't have to bother thinking through everything we're doing in lots of detail. On the right hand side, we have a second system, number two, which is a lot slower and it requires our conscious engagement to work because it requires energy and intention, attention on our behalf. And we tend to use this um, when we want to weigh up very carefully the costs and benefits of things. So it's quite um, hard work and effortful to use. So we don't tend to use that too often. Mm -hmm. And it is like what should I eat for lunch tends to typically be a system one 
one decision. You make it very quickly. It's automatic and it's really not that consequential to your life. So you don't really weigh up all the stats, facts and figures when you're making that choice. So that model has some implications for what we need to do if we want to change change people's choices. And in 2019 at WRI, what we did uh, was we did a very big review of the literature and spoke to lots of people in the food industry to put together a guide, which is available open access on our website, summarising the full range of different techniques that we can use to try to get consumers to change their choices based on targeting both system one and system two. Um, the results of our big review are outlined on the slide that we were showing. There's 57 uh, change strategies in total, and they're shown on this graph. And what that graph is basically displaying is um, our industry sample then ranked um, each of these techniques according to whether or not they thought they were feasible or effective to use in their own restaurants. And we're really interested in the top right-hand corner of that chart, which is all the techniques. You can't read them here. They're, they're in detail on the next slide. But these are the techniques that people thought there's 23 in total mm-hmm. um, were above average in terms of feasibility and impact. So these are the shortlist of the best, uh, best of the bunch. So if you're interested, this is all outlined in the playbook. As I said, it's available on our website and it's designed for use in food service. So we really hope you can pick that up and it'll be useful for you. And then just lastly, before I hand over to Jane, what we're actually trying to do on the next slide <laughs> is now working with Uh, the food industry directly to try to get this information off the pages of the playbook and into restaurants. And we've designed a workshop uh, to do that where we work with different food service providers. We uh, do an audit, a diagnostic questionnaire at the start to understand what people are currently doing. And then we map that back to all the strategies in the playbook to build a a tailored solution to different uh, food service operators to try to help them move their consumers to more sustainable options. And we've been working uh, very closely with Jane and her team at Compass at Google to do this. So I'll hand over to her now and she'll be able to talk through some of the work that we've done together there. Okay, that's uh, very interesting. I think um, if we can summarize this, it's really um, all about how people think about food in the first place. And with the graphs that you have, you can make that change happen, right? Yeah, um, this, this, um, yeah this study, it has taken a long time to get the, to these conclusions, or um, how, how do I see that? In terms of the, the playbook? Yeah. Yeah, it did take us a long time. And <laughs> we, we searched through around 5,000 research papers to get our conclusions here. So it's, a, it's comprehensive, and it's the first um, review that's really sat down with representatives from the food industry and got their perspective as well on what works because the research tends to be um, conducted by academics who don't work day to day with um, rest in restaurants finding out what actually works on the ground so we really hope that we've taken a practical lens to to get this playbook to be something that's actually useful for the service sector yeah as you said we were going to talk to jane but uh, the connection doesn't work um with uh, jane but perhaps you can tell us how she implemented the guidebook and the playbook in in her <laughs> stuff that she did at uh, at google well they, i know the team have done a lot of work at google and jane had a very comprehensive presentation so it's really sad that her link's not working and i hope you can get her online. We've been working quite closely with the team specifically on on one technique from the playbook, which was actually um, our highest ranking technique Mm -hmm. uh, on that graph. It was right in the top right-hand corner. And that was using descriptive language um, on labels and menus to see if we could uh, get consumers to shift their preferences towards more plant-based dishes. And actually throughout 2019, we conducted a study with the Google team, which I think Jane wanted to talk about across five of their international offices where we introduce lots more interesting descriptive dish labels um, for certain vegetarian meals and we, we tracked what happened to the number of their customers that those meals and we found um, really interestingly quite a significant uptick in the amount of plant-based food that was being chosen through a, a three of those five offices the ones actually that were english speaking um, and yeah. suggesting that language has a has an influence 
um, in certain cultures, maybe in, not in others. Um, but that was an interesting uh, thing to do because it's effectively a very cheap and easy um, approach. It literally involves printing off descriptive names on menu cards. Yeah. Um, and I developed those names in conjunction with the chefs in workshops. Um, and that was found to, to lead to a significant, I think it's around 30 or 40% uptick in the amount of plant-based yeah. dishes that were chosen. So as with many of the techniques in the playbook, they're quite simple and easy approaches that um, are often very cheap to implement yeah. and can have a significant effect, especially if we cluster more than one of these together in aggregate. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, it's what Google does really well in like search engines as well, connecting the right metadata with the right search results. But you'd hope they'd be the guys that would be good at using their data to have an impact. And I think they definitely are. <laughs> the, team, the team's really good. Yeah. You think that's, that's really the future and the way to go forward and to, to connect people with a more healthy lifestyle, plant-based lifestyle, even, even when they don't even know that they are doing that? Um, I think we, we find a lot in, in the research on behaviour change that people's choices, as I, as I mentioned in the slides, are not always necessarily conscious. Um, and actually, that bearing that in mind, giving people the information about what they need to do doesn't tend to work that well to motivate a change, um, just because it's not that relevant at time and place that people are making decisions. So I think it's really important to consider the context that people are making their decision around what to eat within. And there's a lot of influences in the food service environment from the, what the staff recommend to you, how the menu's structured, um, how the dishes are described, where they're placed. All these things can have an effect on people's choice without them really realizing it. Yeah. And if we can um, place all these different influences um, just slightly change how they're currently presented in many restaurants, you can find that we can have quite a significant impact on what people are choosing. And at the end of the day, if a restaurant's selling good quality, uh, tasty plant-based dishes, it, and we can find a way to get more people to eat those, the dishes eventually will sell themselves because they're good options in their own right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pity Jane uh, isn't going to join us uh, today. Um, how, how has your rapport with her been uh, during the studies and the implementation of what you've been studying. <laughs> like, I can't really say, I can't say anything. Like, <laughs> no, it's been fantastic. It's been really good working with the team. Yeah. Um, I know they've done loads of interesting work at Google and we were lucky enough to, to go in and review the, the campus and have a look at some. I'm based in London. We had a look at some of their London, the London offices to see some of the amazing things they've done using insights from behavioral science. Um, they have a very comprehensive food offering for their staff. So yeah. their work has been really interesting. And we have later this year, there are some research coming out uh, that will be published. So we'll do our best to publicize that and get that out so people can have a read. And I know the team are working on a number of different initiatives. Um, yeah, they because, can, because I think yeah, the work... <laughs> they can, when they can get the tech working. Yeah, and, and the work, it doesn't stop here, right? It continues and continues. What are the next steps that you're going to take? Well, we're still we're, we're currently discussing, really, the next steps in terms of our work with the guys at Compass. Um, in our own team, we've, we're actually right now running a piece of research on looking at climate messaging for food. We're really interested. A lot of people have started to move over to, to look at climate labels on food or communicating around climate. And we're really interested in how, how to go about doing this in the, in the best way. So what exactly do we talk about in terms of the climate? Do consumers care about greenhouse gas emissions or are they more interested in food being natural or do they want to feel they're part of a movement? So we're working at the moment with some creative professionals to have a look at some different ways of communicating about climate and actually testing those. So that's research that will be coming out from us at the beginning of next year, which we hope will be useful to give a bit of a steer on how restaurants and retailers can go about communicating about climate and the environment when talking about food in a way that keeps consumers interested, doesn't alienate them and actually can help them push them towards um, making a, 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 the right choice. <laughs> I said the right choice, the plant-based choice, yeah. which for me is the right choice. Okay, well, good luck with that. A lot of success and uh, say hi to Jane for us, if you please. <laughs> yeah, we will. Okay, thank you, Sophie, for joining us Bye. at Eating the Gap. <laughs> <laughs>